about disinterest. I have read much of what has been written, both by heathen philosophers and sages, and in the Old and New Testaments. I have sought earnestly and with great diligence that good and high virtue by which man may draw closest to God, and through him which one may best approximate the idea God had of him before he was created when there was no separation between man and God. And having delved into all this writing, as far as my intelligence would permit, I find that high virtue to be pure disinterest, that is, detachment from creatures. As the Lord said to Martha, Unum es necessarium, which is to say, to be untroubled and pure, one thing is necessary, and that is disinterest. The teachers praise love, and highly too, as St. Paul did, when he said, No matter what I do, if I have not love, I am nothing. Nevertheless, I put disinterest higher than love. My first reason is follows. The best thing about love is that it makes me love God. Now it is much more advantageous for me to move God towards myself than for me to move toward Him. For my blessing in eternity depends on my being identified with God. He is more able to deal with me and join me than I am to join Him. Disinterest brings God to me, and I can demonstrate it in this way. Everything likes its own habitat best. God's habitat is purity and unity, which are due to disinterest. Therefore God necessarily gives himself to the disinterested heart. In the second place, I put disinterest above love because love compels me to suffer for God's sake, whereas disinterest makes me sensitive only to God. This ranks far above the suffering for God or in God, for when he suffers man pays some attention to the creature from which his suffering comes, but being disinterested he is quite detached from the creature. I demonstrate that, being disinterested, a man is sensitive only to God in this way. Experience must always be an experience of something, but disinterest comes so close to zero that nothing but God is rarefied enough to get into it, to enter the disinterested heart. That is why a disinterested person is sensitive to nothing but God. Each person experiences things in his own way, and thus every distinguishable thing is seen and understood according to the approach of the beholder, and not, as it might be, from its own point of view. Authorities also praise humility above all other virtues, but I put disinterest above humility for the following reasons. There can be humility without disinterest, but disinterest cannot be perfect without humility. Perfect humility depends on self-denial. Disinterest comes so near to zero that nothing may intervene. Thus, there cannot be disinterest without humility, and, anyways, two virtues are better than one. The second reason I put disinterest above humility is that in humility man abases himself before creatures, and in doing so pays some attention to the creatures themselves. Disinterest, however, stays within itself. No transference of attention, such as humility, can ever rank so high that being self-contained will not go higher. As the prophet puts it, Omnes gloria filae regis ab intus. 
which means the glory of the king's daughter comes from within her. Perfectly disinterested, a man has no regard for anything, no inclination to be above this or below that, no desire to be over or under. He remains what he is, neither loving nor hating, and desiring neither likeness to this or unlikeness to that. He desires only to be one and the same, for to want to be this or that is to want something, and the disinterested person wants nothing. Thus everything remains unaffected as far as he is concerned. Someone may say, Surely Our Lady had all the virtues, and therefore she must have been perfectly disinterested. If then, disinterest ranks above virtue, why did the Lady glory in her humility rather than in disinterest? She said, He hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. I reply by saying that in God there is both disinterest and humility as well, to the extent that virtues may be attributed to God. You should know that it was loving humility that made God stoop to human nature, the same humility by which he created heaven and earth, as I shall explain. And if our Lord willing to become man, still remained unaffected in his disinterest, Our Lady must have known that he desired this for her too, and that, therefore, he would have regard to her humility rather than to her disinterest. Thus she continued, unmoved in her disinterestedness, and yet she gloried in humility. If, however, she had said, he hath regarded my disinterest. Her disinterest would have been qualified by the thought, and not perfect, for she would have departed from it. Any departure from disinterest, however small, disturbs it. And there you have the reason why our Lord gloried in humility rather than in disinterest. The prophet says, Audium qui lucator in me dominus deus, which means, I will be silent and hear what the Lord God will utter within me, as if to say, if God the Lord wants to speak to him, let him come, for I shall not go out. As Boethius put it, ye people, why do you seek, seek without for the blessing that is within you? I also put disinterest above mercy, for mercy is nothing but a man's going out to the want of a fellow, and the heart is disturbed by it. Disinterest, however, is exempt from this, being self-contained and allowing nothing to disturb. To speak briefly, when I survey the virtues, and I find none as flawless as conducive to God as disinterest. A philosopher named Avicenna said, The rank of a disinterested mind is so high that what it sees is true, and what it desires comes to pass. What it commands must be done. You may take this for the truth, that when a free mind is really disinterested, God is compelled to come into it. And if it could get along without contingent forms, it would then have all the properties of God himself. Of course, God cannot give his properties away, so he can do nothing for the disinterested mind except to give himself to it, and it is then caught up into eternity, where transitory things no longer affect it. Then the man has no experiences of the physical order, and is said to be dead to the world since he has no appetite for any earthly thing. This is what St. Paul meant by saying, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
You may ask, what is this disinterest, that it is so noble a matter? Know, then, that a mind is unmoved by any contingent affection or sorrow, or honor, or slander, or vice, is really disinterested, like a broad mountain that is not shaken by a gentle wind. Unmovable disinterest brings man into his closest resemblance to God. It gives God his status as God. His purity is derived from it, and then his simplicity and unchangeable character. If man is to be like God, to the extent that any creature may resemble him, the likeness will come through disinterest, and man proceeds from purity to simplicity, and from simplicity to unchangeableness, and thus the likeness of God in man comes about. It is an achievement of the grace that allures man away from temporal things and purges him of the transitory. Keep this in mind. To be full of things is to be empty of God, while to be empty of things is to be full of God. Bear in mind also that God has been immovably disinterested from the beginning and still is, and that his creation of the heavens of the earth affected him as little as if he had not made a single creature. But I go further. All the prayers a man may offer and the good works he may do will affect the disinterested God as little as if there were neither prayers nor works, nor will God be any more compassionate to stoop down to man any more because of his prayers and his works than if they were omitted. Perhaps, then, you will say, I take it, therefore, that prayers and good works are so much lost motion. God pays no attention to them and will not be moved by them. And yet they say that God wants us to pray to him about everything. Now pay close attention and understand what I mean, if you can. When God first looked out of eternity, if one may say that he ever first looked out, he saw everything as it would happen and at the same time he saw when and how he would create each thing. He foresaw the loving prayers and the good deeds each person might do, and knew which prayers and which devotions he would heed. He foresaw that tomorrow morning you will cry out to him in earnest prayer, and that tomorrow morning he will not heed you because he has already heard your prayer in his eternity before you became a person. And if your prayer is neither honest nor earnest, he will not deny it now, for it is already denied in eternity. In that first eternal vision, God looked on each thing to be, and therefore he does what he now does without a reason. It was all worked out beforehand. Still, even if God remains forever unmoved, disinterested, the prayers and good works of people are not lost on that account, for well-doing is never without its reward. Philippus says, God the Creator holds things to the course in order he ordained for them in the beginning. To God there is neither past nor future, and he loves the saints, having foreseen them before ever the world began. Then, when events, foreseen by God in, in eternity, come to pass in time, people think that God has taken a new departure, either to anger or toward some agreeable end. But it is we who change, while he remains unchanged. Sunshine hurts ailing eyes, but is agreeable to sound ones and yet it is the same sunshine in both cases. God does not see through time, nor does anything new happen in his sight. Isidore 
makes the same point in his book on the highest good. He says, Many people ask what God was doing before he created heaven and earth. Where did he get his new impulse to make creatures? This is the answer. There was never a departure in God, nor a change of intention, as if there were ever was a time when creatures did not exist as they do now. Still they existed forever in God, in the mind of God. God did not make heaven and earth as our time-bound speech describes creation. They came into being when he spoke the word out of eternity. Moses said to our Lord, Lord, if Pharaoh asks who you are, what shall I tell him? The Lord replied, Tell him he who is sent you. We might say, The unchanging one hath sent me. Someone well may ask, Had Christ this unmoved this disinterest when he said, My soul is sorrowful even unto death. Or Mary, when she stood underneath the cross, much has been made of her lamentations. How are such things compatible with unmoved disinterest? On this point the authorities say that a person is not one, but two people. One is called the outward man, the sensual person. He is served by five senses, which function by means of the soul's agents. The other is the inner man, the spiritual person. But notice this, that a man who loves God prefers not to use the agents of the soul in the outward man any more than necessary, and then the inner man has recourse to the five senses only to the degree to which he can guide and lead them. He guards them against animal diversions, such as people choose when they live like animals, without intelligence. Such people are more properly called animals than persons. Whatever strength the soul possesses, beyond what it devotes to the five senses, it gives to the inner man. If this inner man is devoted to some high and noble enterprise, the soul recalls its agents, and the person is said to be senseless or rapt because his enterprise or object is an unintelligible idea or is unintelligible without being an idea. Remember that God requires of every spiritual person a love which includes all the agents in the soul. Thus he said, Love your God with all your heart. There are people who squander the strength of their souls in the outward man. These are the people, all of whose desires and thoughts turn on transient goods, since they are unaware of the inner person. Sometimes a good man robs his outward person of all the soul's agents in order to dispatch them on some higher enterprise. So, conversely, animal people rob the inner person of the soul's agents and assign them to the outward man. A man may ever so active outwardly and still leave the inner man unmoved and passive. Now both in Christ and in Our Lady there was an outward man and an inward person and while they taught about external matters, they were outwardly active, but inwardly unmoved and disinterested. This is how it was when Christ said, My soul is sorrowful, even unto death. And whatever lamentations and other speeches of Our Lady, inwardly she was still unmoved and disinterested. Take an illustration. A door swings to and fro through an angle. I compare the breadth of the door to the outward man and the hinge to the inner person. When the door swings to and fro, the breadth of the door moves back and forth, 
but the hinge is still unmoved and unchanged. It is like this here. Now I ask what the object of pure disinterest is. I reply that it is neither this nor that. Pure disinterest is empty nothingness, for it is on that high plane on which God gives effect to his will. It is not possible for God to do his will in every heart, for even though he is almighty, he cannot act except where he finds preparations made, or makes them himself, I say, or makes them, on account of Paul, for he did not find him ready. He prepared Paul by an infusion of grace. Otherwise, I say, that God acts where he finds that preparations have been made. God's activity is not the same in a man as in a stone. And there is a simile for that, too, in nature. If a bake oven is heated and lumps of dough are put into it, some of oatmeal, some of barley, some of rye, and some of wheat, then, even though there is only one heat for all in the oven, it will not act the same way on the various doughs. For one turns into a pretty loaf, another to a rough loaf and still others rougher. That is not due to the heat, but to the material, which differs. Similarly, God does not work in all hearts alike, but according to the preparation and sensitivity he finds in each. In a given heart, containing this or that, there may be an item which, God, which prevents God's highest activity. Therefore, if a heart is to be ready for him, it must be emptied out to nothingness, the condition of its maximum capacity. So, too, a disinterested heart, reduced to nothingness, is the optimum, the condition of maximum sensitivity. Take an illustration from nature. If I wish to write on a white tablet, then no matter how fine the matter already written on it, it will confuse me and prevent me from writing down my thoughts. So that, if I still wish to use the tablet, I must first erase all that is written on it, but it will never serve me as well for writing as when it is clean. Similarly, if God is to write his message about the highest matters on my heart, Everything must be referred to as this or that. We must first come out and I must be disinterested. God is free to do his will on his own level when my heart, being disinterested, is bent on neither this or that. Then I ask, what is the prayer of the disinterested heart? I answer by saying that a disinterested man, pure in heart, has no prayer. For to pray is to want something from God, something added to that one desires, or something that God is to take away. The disinterested person, however, wants nothing, and neither has he anything of which he should be rid. Therefore he has no prayer where he prays only to be uniform with God. In this sense, we may understand the comment of St. Dionysius on a text of St. Paul, which they run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. That is, all the soul's agents race for the prize, but only the soul's essence receives it. Thus Dionysius says, the race is precisely the flight from creatures to union with the uncreated. When the soul achieves this, it loses its identity. It absorbs God and is reduced to nothing, as the dawn at the rising sun. 
Nothing helps towards this end like disinterest. To this point we may quote a saying of St. Augustine, There is a heavenly door for the soul into the divine nature, where some things are reduced to nothings. On earth this door is precisely disinterest, and when disinterest reaches its apex it will be unaware of its knowledge. It will not love its own love, and will be in the dark about its own light. Here, too, we may quote the comment of an authority. Blessed are the pure in heart who leave everything to God now as they did before they ever existed. No one can do this without a pure, disinterested heart. That God prefers a disinterested heart for his habitation may be seen from the question, what is God looking for in everything? I reply with these words from the Book of Wisdom, I seek peace in all things. There is, however, no peace except in disinterest, therefore God prefers it to any other condition or virtue. Remember, too, that the more his heart is trained to be sensitive to divine influences, the happier he is. The further he pushes his preparation, the higher he ascends in the scale of happiness. But no man can be sensitive to divine influence except by conforming to God, and in proportion to his conformity he is sensitive to divine influence. Conformity comes of submission to God. The more subject to creatures a man is, the less he conforms to God. But the pure, disinterested heart, being void of creatures, is constantly worshipping God and conforming to him and is therefore sensitive to his influence. This is what St. Paul means by saying, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is, conform to Christ. Remember that when Christ became man, he was not one man, but took all human nature on himself. If you get out, therefore, and clear of creatures, what Christ took on himself will be left to you, and you will have put on Christ. If any man will see the excellence and use of perfect disinterest, let him take seriously what, God, what Christ said to his disciples about his humanity. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you as if he said, You take much too much pleasure in my visible form, and therefore the perfect pleasure of the Holy Spirit cannot be yours. Therefore discard the form and be joined to the formless essence, for the spiritual comfort of God is very subtle and is not extended except to those who despise physical comforts. Take heed, intelligent people. Life is good to the man who goes, on and on, disinterestedly. There is no physical or fleshly pleasure without some spiritual harm, for the desires of the flesh are contrary to those of the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are contrary to the flesh. That is why to sow the undisciplined love of the flesh is to cut, be cut off by death, but to sow the disciplined love of the Spirit is to reap of the Spirit life eternal. The less one pays attention to the creature things, the more the Creator pursues him. Listen to this, man of intelligence. If the pleasure we take in the physical form of Christ diminishes our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, how much more will the pleasure we take in the comfort of transitory things be a barrier against God? Disinterest is best of all, for by it the soul is unified, knowledge is made pure, 
the heart is kindled, the spirit awakened, the desire quickened, and the virtue enhanced. Disinterest brings knowledge of God, cut off from the creature. The soul unites with God, for love apart from God is like water to a fire, while love with God is the honeycomb in the honey. Hear this, every intelligent spirit. The steed swiftest to carry you to perfection is suffering, for none shall attain eternal life except he pass through the great bitterness with Christ. Nothing pierces man like suffering, and nothing is more honey-sweet than to have suffered. The surest basis on which perfection rests is humility, and he whose nature kneels in deepest lowliness, his spirit shall rise up to the heights of divinity, for as love brings sorrow, sorrow also brings love. Human ways are various. One person lives thus and another so. For him who wishes to attain the utmost in life, in his time, I set down here several aphorisms, much abbreviated and taken from many writings. Among men, be aloof, do not engage yourself to any idea you get, free yourself from everything chance brings to you, things that accumulate encumber you, set your mind in virtue to contemplation, in which the God you bear in your heart shall be your steady object, the object from which your attention never wavers, and whatever else your duty may be, whether it be fasting, watching, or praying, dedicate it all to this one end, doing each only as much as is necessary to your single end. Thus you shall come to the goal of perfection. Someone may ask, who could long endure this unwavering contemplation of the divine object? I reply, no one living in such times as these I can tell you privately about these things only to have you know what the highest is, so that you may desire it and aspire to it. And if this vision is withdrawn from you, if you are a good man, the withdrawal shall be to you as if the eternity of bliss were taken away. But you must return at once to the pursuit of it, so that it may return to you. Even so, Set a perpetual watch over yourself and your thoughts, and let your refuse be in this vision, in which you abide as constantly as possible. Lord God, be thou praised forever. Amen.